A report from Canada's intelligence service estimates that at least 130 men have left Canada in recent years to join terrorist groups abroad, including the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria. What compels these young men towards violent extremism? Joining us tonight to explore that, Imam Shabir Ali. He is president of the Islamic Information and Dawah Center International. Mohammed Robert Heft, a de-radicalization counselor and president of Paradise Forever. That's a Muslim center that works with youth. Lauren Dawson, professor of sociology and religious studies at the University of Waterloo. Sarah Thompson, professor of criminology at Ryerson University. And Jordan Peterson, professor of psychology at the University of Toronto. And we're grateful to all of you for making the trek out here to Leaside to join us at our makeshift studios uh, for this edition of The Agenda. Let's start with some tape. I want to play a clip of a fellow named Andre Poulain, who's a Canadian from Timmins, Ontario. He was one of those 130 people I just talked about. He changed his name to Abu Muslim. He went to Syria a couple of years ago to join IS. Here's a clip. We'll come back and chat. Roll tape, please. My name is Abu Muslim. I'm your brother in Islam here in Syria. I originally come from Canada. I watched hockey. I went to the cottage in the summertime. I love to fish. I wanted to go hunting. Then, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided me from the darkness of kufr to the light of Iman, to Islam. Before I come here to Syria, I had money, I had a family, I had good friends. Uh, it wasn't like I was some anarchist or somebody who just wants to destroy the world and kill everybody. No, I was a regular person. You know, you can easily earn yourself a high station with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the next life by sacrificing just a small bit of this worldly life. Let's go around our table here and just explore what compels somebody to abandon their normal middle-class Canadian life to join IS, for example. Jordan, you've thought about this? Give us some ideas. Start with one. Well, we don't know how much of it is temperament. We do know that um, people who are drawn to more fundamentalist causes, at least on the right-wing end of the spectrum, are more orderly in their temperament and less open, which is a marker of broad-mindedness and creativity. Um, so there's temperamental contribution. And then the, the period of late adolescence is also a time when people catalyze their identity. And I think that people who are, have one foot in each culture, uh, or in two cultures, have a particularly difficult time in doing that. So sometimes they're impelled to make a move of radical simplification instead of trying to mediate between the moral demands of two cultures. So I would say that's a start. We shouldn't also underestimate the allure of adventure. You know, I mean, people have marched off to war happily for in many, many, on many, many different occasions. So. For centuries. For centuries. Indeed they yeah. have. Yeah. Okay. Lauren Dawson, what would you add to that? Yeah, I'd, I'd reinforce all of that because Jordan's hit upon many of the main factors. Uh, another element that I always add in here is that um, there is a morality plays a central role and that does tie into the fact that it was mentioned that those who convert to more extreme or fundamentalist viewpoints often are seeking this order in the world they want things to be more sharply clearly defined and delineated and a lot of the factors are similar to what might lead someone to join a gang or do other things the key differentiate differentiating variable is this drive for a moral purpose this drive to be associated with a just cause the sense of giving a grander meaning to your life because you're associating yourself with being on the side of the righteous. So that uh, moral component, we're uncomfortable in our society talking about it now in some ways, but I, I'd say that's an, an additional element to what has been mentioned already. That's such a perfect segue to you, who I'm guessing was not born a Muslim, but are a Muslim today. Yeah. Clearly though, converting to Islam and then joining IS I mean, there's a million miles between those two things. You've done the former, but not the latter. So what is it about the latter that so many people find so intriguing? A, a, a simplistic view of the world, I mean, it's, it's black and white. It's the believers and the non-believers. And when you convert to Islam, as I did about 15 years ago, you, you are looking for that moral clarity. Um, sometimes, you know, people don't see it, but delusions of grandeur. We come in and we're, we're sort of built up in our community. You wouldn't know this, but from the inside, we get told we're all forgiven for our sin. We're really good. We're better than everyone else because now we've, we've started with a clean slate. 
And then what happens is sometimes we get bitter because the community, other than getting excited for our conversion, kind of leaves us high and dry. They don't really give us moral and social support. So we sometimes get driven to the internet, which is now what's happening, and then you're finding legitimate grievances overseas. And you're sort of, you know, in, in you're framing in your mind an idea that there's this utopian view of the Islamic State. But the reality is they're getting attracted to the grievances because many of them are legitimate. You can't say they're, they're wrong for having compassion for the people of Syria and around the world who are being oppressed. But then they put their uneducated and narrow-minded view of Islam uh, in, in the, as a, I guess, as a, 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 a dangerous cocktail. And um, when, that, when that happens, it, it leads into, um, obviously, them going there and joining a group that perhaps even when they're there, they don't even realize what they got themselves into. Sarah, let me get you to deconstruct that dangerous cocktail even further. Mm -hmm. what, what takes a kid from Timmins, Ontario, who may very well have sympathy for the grievances of, of poor Muslims around the world, to go hop on the back of a pickup truck with artillery and start trying to kill people? I think that in addition to some of the more individual level explanations that look at you know, an individual person's uh, reasons for becoming radicalized, I think we also need to remember that people are nested, individuals are nested within broader communities. Mm -hmm. And certainly some of the community level research that's looked into um, why people are attracted to radical groups has found that there are very often um, community specific dynamics that shape narratives, popular narratives within communities that either um, uh, garner support for or opposition to radical groups. And so I think we need to think about, you know, radicalization and support for radical groups at the individual level and try and understand the factors that may push an individual person um, toward such groups, uh, but also take a step back and look a little more broadly at some of the community level factors. And also remember that there may be community level pushes, dynamics and narratives that may uh, lead someone to become uh, or feel supportive of radical groups. But the, the opposite is also um, uh, a very important thing that we need to recognize. When you talk about those pushes, what are you mm -hmm. referring to? Well, just community level dynamics that may shape support for radical groups. Um, and they're varied and, they, and um, they are related to a whole series of exogenous uh, factors that are very community specific. Um, at the same time, however, you know, there are counter narratives, very prominent and robust counter narratives that are in place within many communities that oppose radical groups. Um, so narratives are, are a two way street that they, we need to, they we need can to be conflict. mindful of. Shabir Ali, how would you weigh in on this? Well, I'm, I agree with almost everything that's been said here uh, on the panel, uh, so there's no need to repeat that. The one thing I would add here is that uh, in, in the uh, in the imagining of, of the Islamic origins and, and, and what that means for the longevity of, Islamic, of the Islamic faith um, and, and its interpretation, uh, it, it has been thought by Muslims that uh, Islam is a political system that must dominate every other system and this must be the state of affairs for all time to come. And uh, lo and behold, it so happens that the caliphate has been abolished in 1924. And uh, now the Muslim young man or, or woman trying to understand his or her faith and, and his or her place in the, uh, within the wider world uh, now sees that Muslims uh, largely do not have any real power. Uh, some of the Muslim power seems to seem to be puppets for other powers. And instead of uh, Muslims calling the shots in the world, it looks like we're being shot at in every different way. Uh, and, and so the, the entire thing seems to be, have been turned upside down. And it looks like something radical has to be done to change the state of affairs to bring it back to the ideal. So what needs to happen now is that uh, Muslims need to deconstruct that original narrative uh, which has been a misinterpretation to begin with. Mm. We have to, in, our, in understanding our faith, distinguish between uh, what the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did as a prophet and as a speaker on behalf of God, and what he did, on the other hand, as a human being living in his time and place, including his engagement in, in politics. Uh, and we also need to distinguish between uh, the way things were in the world at the time and the way things are in our present world. And, and specifically, I have here in mind the idea that in, in, 
in the ancient world, communities were divided, and that was the nature of the game. People expanded or they were being engulfed. Uh, nowadays, the nature of our life is that we enter into international conventions uh, to make sure that people do not dominate each other, that we le live in peace, we do not attack each other, we can go to bed safely at night knowing that we'll get up tomorrow and we'll attend school. Um, so, so that life tomorrow will be similar to life today and we wouldn't be bombed to smithereens in the middle of the night. Mm. Uh, so we need to uh, draw those two distinct distinctions very clearly between what the Prophet Muhammad did as a, a, a prophet and what he did as a human being uh, and the second distinction between the way in which things were at the time and the way things are now. Jordan, psychologically speaking, when this kind of thing happens that we're talking about tonight, does a switch in the mind just flick? Or is this more gradual developing phenomenon from what you well, can tell? Well, a switch in the mind can flick. I mean, you see this sometimes with recovering alcoholics who become religious overnight. Um, <clears throat> you can imagine your mind as a, as a battleground between different moral systems, especially in a modern state. And there are times when there are compelling reasons for one of those warring factions to take over. And it, it does have something to do with that search for moral clarity with utopianism, which is, which is a real problem because you can understand why people would seek the good, right? Mm -hmm. But paradoxically, the consequence of people seeking the good on an ultimate level, say in the 20th century, was a string of never-ending catastrophes. And so there's, there's also some proclivity towards that higher order moral thinking, you know, that, that's concerned with systems and systemic perfection. It also seems to be deeply rooted in this. And that seems to be somewhat of a temperamental characteristic as well. I'm trying to figure out, Sarah, what, like, what compels somebody to leave a normal middle class existence and then go literally cut somebody's head off with a knife on a video? I mean, those seem like completely impossible things to figure out. How do you figure that out? It is indeed uh, a highly multifaceted and complex issue. Um, uh, you know, again, my expertise lies in sort of the understanding of community level dynamics. And I think what we need to be careful not to do, I mean, I, I can't really speak to ISIS, ISIL, IS, um, but I can speak more generally about radicalization and, and, and people's attractions to radical groups. And I, I think it's really, really important that we not pathologize it. We not view um, people who are drawn to these groups as inherently evil or, you know, um, um, they may be. That's certainly part of the story, perhaps. Um, but people also very often have very legitimate grievances, what they perceive to be very legitimate grievances um, that they feel that they must, um, you know, act upon. Um, and certainly, um, you know, there are lots of examples that you could draw on. Um, the Tamil diaspora in Canada, for example, uh, many Tamils who came to Canada fled Sri Lanka, uh, fled the, the civil war in Sri Lanka, and Canada's response, and perhaps more importantly, their lack of response, their inaction with respect to what was going on on the ground in Sri Lanka, um, led many Tamils in diasporas around the world um, to view the LTTE, a radical group, um, as, um, you know, freedom fighters, freedom fighters, right? I mean, I can't tell you how many second-generation Tamils, um, you know, re-articulate Arafat's comment about one man's terrorist being another's freedom fighter. Um, and so, you know, again, I think we need to, we need to take a step back um, and also look at some of the, the, the broader um, forces that may shape uh, people becoming drawn to these sorts of groups. Um, it can be an issue of pathology, it can be evil, all of those things, but it also may be grounded in more, more legitimate grievances. Well, fair enough, but Lorna, uh, again, w I, my hunch, is, never mind that the act of cutting somebody's head off on video is barbaric enough, obviously mm -hmm. it is. But I've talked to so many people who said, and the person had a, you know, an English accent. How does somebody who grows up in, you know, what for so many people is a rather civilized country and then do that yeah I don't I, I don't think I mean there's the hub of the matter we don't know exactly what allows or, or precipitates that extreme kind of enactment of violence but we've got a, there's a couple of things we need to get on the table one is that regrettably we're in a situation where we lack data 
there really aren't, there is no what we would call primary data. No one's, we have anecdotal information, we have news reports, we have some data gathered from just gathering up large uh, uh, quantitative data, meaning did they go to school, not go to school. But we don't know what their experience at school was. It's not like we've interviewed these people. No one's and gone out and interviewed their childhood. It, right. I'm involved in an attempt to do that now. There's a handful of scholars around the world now, in our cumbersome way, having to work our way through ethical clearances and things of that nature, to finally go out and talk to individuals. Because, as Sarah said, we need to, and I've stressed this in all my presentations, we need to humanize these people, right, and recognize that for the most part as the New York City Police Department said, they are remarkably ordinary individuals in terms of their profile who end up doing something extraordinary. So the key is the process they go through. Mm -hmm. And the process is an internalized one, it's an internal struggle, but it also involves external factors like who they associated with, what kind of pressures were put upon them, peer pressure, mm -hmm. the influence of charismatic leaders online and also at a lesser level in their immediate circle of acquaintances. Now, we can only get at that by talking to them and have them give us their narrative, their story of their life as to why they did it. And, uh, you know, so in a way we're, we're sort of wandering in the dark until we get more of that information. Now, we do have analogies, which a lot of everyone here is trying to use. So we know a lot about how people have become involved in analogous circumstances. Extreme new religious movements, fundamentalist movements in general, criminal activity. So we can draw upon those analogies to come to logical inferences, but we can't match it to real data about these Got people. It. You wanted to add? Well, young men also have a, many of them have a very strong drive for heroism and dominance. Um, there's a variety of reasons for that. One of them is that young women are much more likely to be attracted to dominant men. So it's deeply, it's a deeply rooted drive. And people are able to take on victimization on behalf of a group, even if they haven't been victimized themselves. That's a very, very well-known social psychological phenomena. Then there's no reason to assume that middle-class normality is the moral be-all and end-all mm -hmm. for people who are driven by quasi-messianic motivations. And then with regards to the group identity issue, you never want to underestimate the motive, motivating power of resentment and victimization. I mean, when you take on the burdens of a group, especially one that you perceive as low in the dominance hierarchy, and you construe that group as a victim, that's a real precursor to the use of violence. And because you can justify it as, as deserved and also as defensive. And we, we know from the emergence of violent movements all around the world that atrocity is also often preceded by a dialogue of victimization on the part of the people who are committing the atrocities. So resentment's, resentment's key to these sorts of things. Let me pick up on the gender issue though. You, you run a center for youth mm -hmm. where you try to deal with some of these issues. Is it overwhelmingly male kids that you deal with there? I think you'd be surprised a lot of the behind the scenes for the women there, they can motivate men um, to do some crazy things. It's just that I think we kind of just assume they're, you know, they must be innocent. I, and I, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to stereotype women, but they're not taking us seriously, quite honestly. And uh, yet behind the scenes, I remember when I came back from Iraq, uh, my wife asked me, what well, you're coming back for, you hypocrite? And uh, it sounds like harsh, but oh, I was there in 2003 during shock and awe. So everyone is assuming that probably I was going to be killed. So when I came back, uh, you know, and my wife didn't say it in a bad way, but she just, she wanted to know why I came back. So women can be, you know, uh, a driving force behind the scenes for sure. You did, I'm trying to remember here, uh, the Toronto 18, this is going back to 2006, I think, mm -hmm. and you've worked with a couple of the yeah. Toronto 18, I gather. These were the people who had terrorist plots that were going to behead the prime minister and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, how, I mean, how would you characterize uh, What's going on in their heads? What was going on in their heads? I think the vast majority, even of the Toronto 18, had we had a proper constructed um, uh, intermediator program, like something, a, a de-radicalization de program at the time, and you know, trusted intermediators would have uh, approached them. I think the vast majority of them would have turned, uh, turned back and regretted some of their ideas. I think you can't win them all, but, um, but at the time, I, 
the delusions of grandeur, like I said, they, you know, they really see themselves as a solution. You know, just to get inside of our heads when we're in that stage, because I went through it, you, you basically think you're the solution to all the world's problems. Like, I mean, let's be straight. I mean, inside you have, I call it the Khalifa complex. Mm -hmm. I really believed I was going to save the world. How? Well, by either guiding them to Islam or bringing them to Islam, at least in, in law. You know, there's no compulsion in religion. We can't make people's hearts believe. But when you're in that, you think, well, at least you can make a society that can respect the law of God. I mean, you're, you're that adamant about making sure you're upholding it. So when you're in that frame, it's almost like a, a mind frame. It's almost like a cult. So, you're, you know, if I'm on the show right now and they're watching the show, like, you have to understand, this is really deep. This is part of the de-radicalization program. Uh, program I'm involved in. They're going to watch this and they're going to watch and analyze every word I say. And how do you win them is you challenge them. One thing I want to point out when they were saying why they behead them, they're going to go the whole way. If you look at Essen Geyer, who's allegedly on charges right now, he's going the whole way. He thinks he's reaching out to people by saying, I don't recognize Canadian law. He's going the whole way. So they're going to go the whole way. Their passports are now taken away or burnt. So they can't come back. So they're going to try to recruit. It's a, you know, seeing a misery loves company. But in reality, some of them were sincere when they went. I have no doubt about it. But some of them, when they got there, they were like, the lesser of two evils in their world is, yes, they beheaded somebody, but at least they're striving to go closer to Islam than a society that's becoming, a, you know, basically immoral, uh, full of all kinds of vices that Islam prohibits. So, I mean, in their world, they just look at it like, okay, we're making mistakes, but at least we're headed in the direction of the Khalifa. Well, I should go to Shabir Ali on that. Is there anything in your scriptures that says it's okay to behead people if they go um, to Syria to be aid workers for poor people? On the contrary, the, the, the Quran in the ninth chapter, the sixth verse, actually tells Muslims that uh, if one of the polytheists who are actually at war with Muslims uh, were to come seeking refuge uh, with the Muslim community, they should be granted refuge uh, so that they will hear the word of God and afterwards they are to be transported. This is by direct command in the Quran. It says, and then, you should transport that person back to his place of safety. Uh, after all is, is done, he's come in, he sought refuge, he heard the word of God. Now he doesn't want to believe and stay, he wants to go. You, you are required as a Muslim to take that person back to his place of safety. That's by direct command in the Quran. Why, why are these executioners not getting that part of the message? There, the other things are, are highlighted and emphasized for them. Um, and, and this is where Muslims need to look very carefully at the books that our children are reading and books that are being taught and read in groups. I traveled for many years uh, with a group that reads one particular book and, and insists that that's the one book that, that defines Islam for uh, this movement. And, and in that book, you will have a chapter dealing with valor and heroism, recounting stories of uh, Muslim men and women who went in battle and uh, suffered martyrdom in, in, in the fiercest manner imaginable and inflicted uh, wounds in, in, in fighting as well. Uh, and, and you have another chapter that deals with the importance of, of learning and ga gaining knowledge. Uh, so that was the chapter that meant more, most for me. But, but the other chapter about the valor and heroism may actually click with someone else. And someone may say, well, I want to be like that guy who died in that uh, um, most pitiable manner hmm. uh, so that I meet God with all of these wounds in my body. Oh, uh, and if in the meantime I could kill off some of the enemies, uh, then uh, I get two, two benefits. Bonus. The, yeah, exactly. Hmm. Muhammad mentioned something about a cult, a cult-like behavior surrounding all of this. And Lauren, I wanted to follow up with you on that. How much of what we're seeing, these Western people running off to join IS in the middle of the desert and recreate the caliphate and so on, how much of that is uh, similar to uh, cult-like behavior? Well, they're really strong analogies, and that's how I got involved in this kind of research in general, because I'm a sociologist of religion, studying new religious movements, and then studying how some of those new religious movements become violent. And the process, I would say, is almost identical. I mean, it would be difficult to get into details, but the step-by-step -step mechanism by which a fairly ordinary kid takes what used to be called a you know, radical departure, was a term used in t context of new religious movements, is very similar in these circumstances. And 
it relies heavily on the things we've been talking about, identity issues, vulnerability on identity issues, a quest for significance, meeting the right people at the right time, a lot of contingent factors, mm -hmm. peer pressure, which we really haven't talked about now at this point, all comes into play. And so, it, you know, there is, it's a very similar process. The difference is, and they're both driven, as I already said, as opposed to someone joining a gang, by this kind of moral imperative, this, uh, this mm -hmm. desire to be part of the righteous. And you need a bit of historical perspective on that to realize that that's driven sectarian forms of religiosity for centuries, right? Even our ancestors who took some very extreme uh, religious views and oppositions to each other and fought many wars, right? Resulting in a great deal of bloodshed just a few hundred years ago, right? Were people thinking they had the truth, right? And wanting to be associated with truth because your being part of that small elect that wins mm. is more important than anything else. But let me pick up on peer pressure. I, I, I don't know this, but I find it hard to believe that in Timmins, Ontario no, in I... 2012, this fellow's peers would have been saying to him, putting pressure on him, to go halfway across the world and join IS and kill people. Is that, I mean, that's not crazy for me to say that, isn't it? Well, you so where's the find, peer pressure? You can find your peers in different places. I mean, you can find your peers in books you can find your peers online, right. you know, and especially now. Um, one of the things that's interesting to consider is that is, is one of the complexities of this problem is that a lot of the things that the ordinary person regards as moral get exaggerated in these situations and become pathological. And that's part of what makes it so tricky. So this really tight in-group identity, that's indistinguishable in many ways from loyalty. And this drive to be dominant and say messianic, that's very difficult to dissociate from striving for achievement. And, and so th th these things start to become pathological though when the person's viewpoint becomes closed to any other information. And there's, that's where totalitarianism starts to develop. And that has been the focus of, of study and religious study for a long time in the West because the primary figure of evil Satan is essentially characterized by the absolute belief that what he knows is absolutely right and sufficient. And so when you take your morality to the point where everything you know is enough and you don't need any more information at all, well, then you've crossed the line from, from moral to judgmental and rigid. And the step from there, especially if you're resentful to violence and pathology and pathological behavior, is a very short one. But the, the horror of it is, is that it's the exaggeration of many things that we would regard as admirable that produce this outcome. So Studies of, of people who join new religious movements and have even engaged in fairly extreme and violent behavior show that, in fact, there are kids who have absorbed the norms of the society of their parents more strongly than others. And mm -hmm. they're offended that their society, as they grow up, is apathetic about those right. value positions. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to reinforce mm -hmm. the point made here, right? So they're not uh, delinquent bad kids. They're kids who really believed it all. Mm -hmm. And then as they grow up into adolescence, they're very disappointed with the world. Well, Mohammed, let me s let's do a little what if here. If you were speaking to a potential, for lack of a better expression, homegrown terrorist mm -hmm. here in Canada, how would you explain to them that you don't need to do that? You can actually find meaning in a spiritual slash religious life right here in the province of Ontario. I wouldn't even limit it there. I have no problem if they, they have problems with Canada and they want to leave, but there's ways to go about it. I'm not trying to stop people from believing that they can live amongst Muslims and live a better life. I'm trying to stop them from taking vigilante acts of violence and terrorism and bring it to the streets of Toronto and around the world. So I don't really care if they're not pacifists, because I'm not a pacifist, but I'm concerned when they're willing to engage in acts of violence that's going to lead them down a path where they're going to hurt innocent civilians. Even for example, I mean, Israel, some of the people went back and joined the IDF to fight against Hamas. How can I tell, for example, a Palestinian man who's in Canada and he wants to go back and help the Palestinians, maybe not Hamas, but the Palestinians? I can't say anything. But if he told me I'm going to go strap a bomb to himself, and he's going to go blow up innocent civilians, then I'll cooperate for justice and try to stop him from doing that. So I set my guidelines at imminent threats of vigilante or terrorist violence. So talking the person out of it, first of all, is letting him know that 
I'm not here to tout the, the Canadian government's line on foreign policy. I completely disagree. But I believe if we engage and bring in a better, lesser of two evils or greater of two goods government, then perhaps we can adjust the foreign policy to be more balanced towards Israel and all other nations around the world. Now, if you can get them to buy in, then you have to get on a theological level. And that you have to challenge them is where did they learn their religion from? They're taking their religion from what we call Mufti Yahoo or Sheikh Google. So a lot of them don't even know. They're just reading stuff, but they don't even know who translated it. So they're saying they're reading the Quran. They're not reading the Quran. They're reading an interpretation of somebody's understanding of the Quran. Which may not be accurate. Which may not be accurate. Yeah. Then they're latching on to personalities like Osama bin Laden, Imam Anwar al -Aki. And then when they, they, they take that narrative with the grievances, it, I said it's a volatile cocktail because what ends up happening is they end up justifying things that normally they couldn't see themselves justifying, but because they see them as the rebellious leaders of this ummah or this you know, leader of this nation, they latch on to them. And, and one thing I want to say about the beheading and irony to the people of ISIS watching this is you don't believe in nationalism. They don't believe in nationalism, but they punish those three individuals for their association with what? With uh, Britain America and, and Britain. America. The irony of their whole thing, if it's two camps, believers and unbelievers, in their own understanding, they've already blown it. They don't even understand the fact that no soul will be burdened with the, the sin of another, according to, our, according to our book, according to Allah. Yet they punished him for the perceived injustices of the foreign policy of a nation they don't even believe hmm. in. You talk about community influence mm -hmm. here and the uh, impact that can have on uh, perhaps someone who's a lost soul and mm -hmm. looking to make a mark in the world. Are the communities of this country doing a good enough job to be aware of those dangers and counteract them? Good question. Um, I think there was a uh, point that I wanted to make with respect to religion and the role that religion is thought to play in radicalization. Um, and it's very often very, I think, simply understood as a risk marker, right? People who become too religious, oh, we should worry about them. Um, perhaps. However, what the research shows is that for the vast majority of people, religion and Islam is a protective factor. Right? People who are deeply religious um, you know, are not those people who are taking up arms and going overseas. Right? They're the people who um, believe um, in more, more peaceful ways of dealing with, with conflict and, and grievance. And certainly um, that also fosters a particular collective dynamic. Um, and so I can speak to within the Somali diaspora in Toronto, for example, there are very, very, very aggressive counterframes in place within that community that view al-Shabaab and al-Shabaab's uh, use of the Quran um, as a perversion of Islam um, and very, very thoughtful counter rebuttals to many of the claims, the religious claims that al-Shabaab makes in their recruitment strategies. So I think, so I think we also need to look um, at religion as, for the vast majority of people, as a protective factor rather than a risk marker. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we also need to be aware that religion um, and, and interpretations of the Quran that are grounded in, in reality and not in misinterpretations or in perversions um, can play a very key role in shaping opposition to radical groups within communities. Uh, that is interesting because that goes against what the conventional wisdom of the day is, which Absolutely. is the more religious you are, the more likely you are to do this. Absolutely. You're and saying it isn't so. Not necessarily so. And there's you know, an increasing body of research, and I'm sure Lauren can speak to this, that, that highlights the protective factors of, right. um, of religion. In, uh, in prisons, etc. now they're finding the research is showing that the single best group in pr prisons to prevent radicalization are the Salafi groups. Mm -hmm. So the groups that are holding to a very fundamentalist, we would call in kind of mm -hmm. simple sense, a fundamentalist Islamist view. And they're able to demonstrate that you don't need to go to the limit of the radicalized violence, the extreme jihadist perspective, in order to accomplish most of what you want to accomplish in terms of your religious Find belief. that encouraging? Yeah, so the Salafi groups, and this, this is mainly research out of France, but it's starting to be replicated elsewhere. Overwhelmingly, the prison officials are starting to realize that the real frontline protectors are the ones who, they used to lump Salafists in with jihadists. Now they're recognizing the Salafist community in prison, also in places like Brixton in England, are actually at the forefront of trying to redirect youth successfully away from radicalization. Jordan. Um, I spent a lot of time looking at how totalitarian states like the Soviet Union came about at a psychological level. And one of the people who really guided me in that 
search was Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And as you know, he wrote a book that was instrumental in bringing the Soviet Union down. And Solzhenitsyn addressed the problems we're talking about very deeply because he was willing to note, to begin with, that the idea that the, that the world is a battleground between good and evil is an extremely old idea. And mm -hmm. it's true for everyone's worldview. People just switch what they consider good and what they consider evil. Now, Solzhenitsyn's solution to that was that people recognize that the line between good and evil runs down the middle of their own heart rather than being played out by the good and the evil on a broader scale. And he regarded the highest moral impulse as that which strived for, for self-improvement on the moral plane. And I teach a course on the psychology of religion at the University of Toronto and lots of students are looking for identity and meaning in their life. And it's not that difficult to point out to young people that their primary domain of moral concern should be with regards to their own behavior and their own actions. And as soon as they understand that and can see its, its relationship with broader religious ideals, they're much less susceptible to any kind of totalitarian nonsense. I mean, you, you can't deny the primary religious impulse, although people do that all the time. It has to be shaped, and it, and it has to be shaped in a way that doesn't produce these totalitarian outcomes. But, you know, that's something that even though we had all the catastrophes that characterized the 20th century, we haven't really taken seriously yet. Hmm. Shabir Ali, uh, you've... I've asked you this question in the past. You've been asked it by numerous other people in the past. You're one of the, if I may put it this way, um, kind of one of the shining lights out there who uh, attempts to um, speak on behalf of the Muslim community in, in speaking out against extremist interpretations of, uh, of the Quran. But is there enough of that going on? I think there has to be a lot more uh, until it and the, the 100, 130 that has gone abroad, uh, that kind of number reduces to absolute zero. Um, um, we, we need to do much more than, than we have done. And one of the things that uh, to me seems essential is that, uh, you know how Lauren was speaking about uh, the particular group known as Salafis, and, and that is not necessarily violent. And in fact, some Salafis can be counter uh, violent. Well, th the problem is not with one particular group. The problem I see is that there is a bedrock understanding of what Islam is. It's almost like the soil in which you're going to plant your understanding of Islam. So on that same soil, you can have a Sufi understanding, you can have a Salafist, you can have a Diobandi, you can have so many varieties. But what is that basic uh, bedrock? Uh, it, it is commonly thought that to understand Islam, you go back to the Quran, true. Uh, we, I think all Muslims do agree on that. But what happens is that we don't stick with the Quran alone. Then it goes to hadith narratives of what the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him said and did and much of this is actually uh, read back into his life later inventions about him mm. uh, and so if you have for example uh, people with a violent streak who were trying to justify their own violence uh, as, as Islam was being expanded and uh, expanding and uh, as uh, it was expanding and it was taking over new territory to justify the violence at the time people were reading back their own violence into the life of the Prophet Muhammad and attributing this kind of violence to him. Mm -hmm. So when uh, the Muslim youth reads that nowadays, because all of the group seems to agree that you go back to the Quran and also to the narratives about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, without a careful delineation and distinction between what is really authentically his and what is the later attribution, uh, now uh, all of that violence is lumped together and imagined about the Prophet who is our hero and role model. So if the young Muslim wants to be like the Prophet Muhammad, which is is what we are telling them all of the time, then they go back to these narratives which we didn't cite, uh, but, but we, we have cited the source, uh, the, the pot in which all of these mm -hmm. ingredients can be found. But you see how it gets perverted along the exactly. way. Exactly. So when they go and pick up on these ingredients, for example, you might find a narrative which says, I have been commanded to fight against people until they declare that there is no God but God and that Muhammad is the messenger of God and they establish the prayer and they pay the charity. If they do all that, then they have protected their lives and property from me 
except for that which is legislated in, in the religion, meaning in terms of capital punishment. So uh, with a narrative like that, what is clearly understood, and this is mentioned in the commentaries on this hadith, is that this is the program. It's totalitarian. The, the Prophet Muhammad has the mandate to go out and fight against everyone until they declare the testimony of the Islamic faith. And not only that, but they also pray and give the charity which would mean by implication that if a Muslim neglects his prayer, the Muslim too can fall under the sword mm -hmm. of this uh, 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 marching juggernaut. Uh, so to, to, we, we need to change that narrative and say, look, emphasize the Quran because that's the number one primary source. And if you look in the Quran, you will see that the verses in Surah 9, which have similar wording to what is in this hadith, actually point in the other direction. Those verses say, in fact, that if somebody were to embrace Islam from among those whom you are fighting against, then you have to cease fighting against them. So it, it, according to the Quran, you are to stop fighting once somebody embraces Islam. <laughs> and the hadith is you, you are to keep fighting until they embrace Islam. It's two different worldviews here. <laughs> One takes war for, for granted. That's the state of affairs. What do we do in the state of war? It, as many different reasons can be given for seizing war, including, for example, if the transgressors should seize and desist, then that's the end of all war. But if the transgressors should embrace Islam, that will be the first sign that they're ready to seize and desist, then the war stops. Muslims are to cease fighting. In the Hadith, it's the opposite. It's saying, regardless of whatever else is happening, you are to keep marching and fighting against them until they embrace Islam. Two different views. Understood. Yeah. Jordan. See, I also think, you know, we've been talking about extremism, but we, we haven't specifically been talking about Muslim extremism. And I've been trying to understand Islam for a long time and have found it extraordinarily difficult to, to get a handle on. Um, the, it isn't clear to me that the Islamic community has managed to agree upon themselves just what precisely constitutes a reasonable separation between the state and religion. And I think part of the reason that there's so much sectarian conflict within Islam itself is because this has never been properly sorted out. Um, because for many, they're one and the same. Well, that's one interpretation, at mm -hmm. least. And the alternative interpretation doesn't seem to allow any well-delineated guidelines for how you would constitute a state that would be, in some sense, separate from Islam. I mean, it was almost immediately upon the Prophet Muhammad's death that struggle over political power began mm -hmm within Islam, and it has never stopped. So you imagine you're a young guy who's trying to sort himself out as a good Muslim. It's like, especially if he is relatively politically naive and is striving for, for simplicity. Taking a nuanced view of all this conflict isn't going to set his soul at rest, mm -hmm. right? You need simplicity for that, and that pushes you towards a more totalitarian interpretation. Well, We've got to balance things out here, though. And so, you know, everything that's being said, I agree with 100%. And we, we've got a tension even going here in our discussion, and that is that on the one hand, we do want to argue that uh, maturity of religion is a protection, and if people can be moved towards a more mature perspective, they'll probably overcome their tendencies to move in a radicalizing direction. Community support in terms of religious development is very important and acts as a prophylactic. But we don't want to then switch to the viewpoint that this isn't a religious phenomenon, because it is. It may be a uh, ill-formed, it may be an immature form of religious expression, but it's a very intense, sincere one on the part of the people who are expressing it. Well, and it's a religious style of motivation. Now, I'm bringing that up because we often then want to think, well, it's not really about religion, it's about political agenda. So if we can just deal with the political issues, it will go away. I'm quite convinced that's not the case. Right. Yeah. As we first were saying, it's more about this individual religious aspiration. It may be a very uh, confused one. Otherwise, class kids wouldn't be interested That's in right. it because they've already got the political and economic yeah. problems And so, so politics and religion gets involved, but religion is always the dominant, I would say the dominant interpretive component is always religious. Although, Muhammad, last week President Obama said, ISIS is not Islamic. Is he right or is he wrong? Well, the, the problem is they believe they're, they're following Islam, so I mean, you know, whether we, you know, we, we all agree that it's a, a faulty version of Islam, the, the fact is they believe it. So to just dismiss it and say that Islam has nothing to do with it, well, they believe it, so Islam will be the solution. It's just your counter narrative have to come with a better understanding than they, you know, they're following, if they can be won over at all. Hmm. 
So I understand both sides. I understand Muslims getting defensive and saying there's no such thing as Islamic terrorism. I get it. It's an oxymoron. But the reality is, from another person's perspective, they're seeing it rooted in the idea around mm -hmm. the Muslim religion. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't take offense to it. I understand it when it's contextualized on both sides. It, it's not meaning any offense to 99.9% .9 of the Muslims. But having said that, you know, it, people use it. And, and that's part of the, by the way, at one point is, that's part of the narrative is that they blame Islam and the West is always talking and we're on the show today and it's, we're always in the media and it's always about Muslims, yet there's drones out there, there is a bias for the Israeli policies. All these things are out there as, as narratives to, to then say, well, look, uh, you're being biased against 130 Muslims in, in Canada when there's a, a million other that are law-abiding citizens that never make it to television. Mm -hmm. Uh, let me go out on a bit of a tangent here, Sarah, I'll bring you in first on this. Uh, violent extremism is obviously not the sole purview of religion in general or Muslims in particular, obviously. Uh, we've seen eco-terrorism, for example, where, uh, I mean, I remember in Toronto, what was it, 30 years ago, um, somebody blew up a weapons manufacturer uh, near the airport in Toronto because they were opposed to the cruise missile guidance systems that were being made in the, I think it was a Litton Systems plant out there. They blew the place up. Do um, you see some correlation here? I think when we talk about homegrown terrorism, there is a tendency to other it away and think of it in terms of, of um, um, Islamic terrorism, for, f to use that phrase. Um, what law enforcement will tell you is that um, that's certainly a, a concern. People that are radicalized and then who, who uh, support radical groups and then go overseas and take up arms, that's a concern. Um, but their relative numbers are a lot smaller than um, groups, eco-terrorist groups, for example. Um, I hear a lot of discussion in law enforcement circles about uh, Freeman on the land and the concerns over sort of right-wing radical groups who are becoming more and more entrenched um, here um, and the and the and the the threats um, that they may pose um, domestically, um, and so I think it's you know when we talk about homegrown terrorism, there's a tendency to sort of think and and it's because of a popular stereotype um, of a particular community, um, and I would encourage us to think a little more broadly about these issues and remember that sort of the domestic threat um, may not be related to them necessarily at mm -hmm. all. Sheldon, let's do board three here. I'm on the bottom of page six. This is a, a quote from Ed Hussein from the London Evening Standard. We'll read this and then come back and chat. It says, we squirm at the mention of religion, politics, and immigration, and yet the answers to countering the appeal of radicalism among some Muslims in the West rests in more, not less, debating of religion, pluralist politics, and integrating immigrants. Our political correctness often paralyzes us from doing so. But in an underworld of radical websites, YouTube videos, web chat rooms, prisons, and some university campuses, the ideology that pits the West against Islam is alive and vibrant. Uh, political correctness get in the way of some of our progress on this? Oh, it does. Yeah, I think that's definitely the case at times. Um, it, it's, it's kind of a, I, I, you know, it's interesting to think of concrete incidences. So uh, I'm at a conference at The Hague and we're discussing uh, immigration policy in the United States, Europe, Holland, Canada, and it's a bit of relationship to radicalization. And everyone sort of in the room just slowly comes to this understanding and starts looking at the Canadians and saying, you have less terrorist activity, why is that? You're doing something right, right? And it must have something to do with multiculturalism. Have you explored that? And we all know that, but in a way we haven't really drilled down on it and explored it because it brings two controversial <laughs> subjects together and everyone's loath to open up that can of worms, right? But there is something there, But obviously. there's something there. And you see it, uh, Holland, let's say, for a very small country, has a much uh, more severe problem in terms of Islamist uh, radicalization. But when you watch their policies to basically, they call it multiculturalism, but from a Canadian perspective, I've been at their opening sort of introductory sessions for new immigrants. It's, not. it's all assimilation. It's all trying to base, turn them how to be a good Dutch person, mm -hmm. right? Right down to how to greet someone, how to take gifts at certain occasions, et cetera. Things we'd never think of telling a Canadian, you must learn these things to be a Canadian. So these things all do need to be thrown on the table. Jordan. I think political correctness is a help and a hindrance. I mean, it makes people polite, so that's helpful. 
but it does stop people from trying to understand where the real differences are and then discuss them. Like one real difference might be, well, can you have a peaceful state that's grounded in religious principles? You know, that narrowly within religious principles. I mean, Israel struggles with that problem constantly. And you see the same thing constantly in the Islamic can world. Just, can I just check, do you see Israel as a religious state or as a secular state? I see it as a state that doesn't know whether it's a religious state or a secular state. Mm -hmm. And that's a big problem. I mean, it's a Jewish homeland, so the implication is strong that it's a religious state. Although I know there's been more than plenty of discussion among the people of Israel themselves about which of those perspectives should, should predominate. But this is why I, I mentioned the problem that Islam has had before about separating church from state. And it seems to me that that's a, a topic that Canada could benefit by, could, could contribute because of our peaceful intermingling, we could contribute to that as an actual debate. Like, me, what is the right relationship between the state and religion in, in Islam? You've raised a great point. Let me follow up with the Imam on that. D does Islam have a particular problem among world religions uh, surrounding the things we've been talking about today because it's not sure uh, how much of theocracy or democracy it really wants its countries to be. Yes, there is a particular problem here in that in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it looks like there was no separation. Uh, he was the one man for all. He uh, was a mouthpiece for God, but he was also a, a, a statesperson. And uh, Muslims see his role as similar to that of Moses. He was both spokesperson for God and uh, a statesman at the same time. Uh, legislator and judge and, and all of this. Uh, so if, if he's our model, then uh, to be a good Muslim today must seem to mean that we must be both. Uh, and uh, how does that uh, uh, allow us then to be Canadian or British uh, or uh, of some other nationality and at the same time be a good Muslim? For, for many people, this is a deep-seated conflict. Tricky. And uh, many older persons like myself uh, have come to just uh, be complacent with the, the status quo. Uh, we happen to be Canadian, we're happy, we enjoy the beautiful life and all of the luxury and so on. Uh, and, and we still consider ourselves good Muslims. But there is no theological uh, discussion on this to, to show that this actually is the correct position. It just seems that we have adopted this for convenience and we're happy with all of the luxury and we've forgotten the life hereafter and we've forgotten our obligations. What happens then is that the young person growing up in Canada or Britain or elsewhere is now uh, benefiting from all of this luxury and has the luxury now to think and to go back to the books and to study and, to, and, and they're discovering that, wait a minute, these older people uh, have really uh, forgotten about the religion. My parents, to begin with, have taken a house on, on, a, on, a, on a mortgage which they should have been uh, prohibited and it looks like they're not really uh, working for the establishment of the Islamic State which should have been the ideal so what we need to do as Muslims now is to show that uh, the the Islamic State it, it can actually come uh, but but it has to be born out of a grassroots system it, it has to be a situation where people voluntarily through the preaching of Islam uh, have accepted the Islamic uh, ethos and they want something that we will call an Islamic State and when we call that an Islamic state, it would not necessarily resemble the state as it was 1400 years ago. It'll be like with all of the modern workings of a, of a modern environment. Malana Wahiduddin Khan is one of the scholars uh, out of India who has written a lot about this. So in answer to Jordan's uh, point about like how, how do we uh, make this happen uh, and where's the discussion about this and how can people be guided to um, make this separation. Uh, Malana Wahiduddin Khan in his books uh, uh, make it clear that the, the time of the Prophet Muhammad some 1400 years ago was the age of monarchy and kingship. That's the time when people generally just believed in what their kings believed. Nowadays we're in the age of democracy where people are free thinkers and they can decide for themselves and they have the intellectual capacity to do that. So when we make that distinction we need to uh, explain Islam as actually embracing a, a democratic system in which people will voluntarily, if they wish, embrace uh, a, a religious view, and then that religious view will naturally be reflected in, in their laws. And to me, this actually is rooted in the Quran itself. Uh, but, but I don't have time to explain that. I, if I do, in fact, I will. In fact, we have 30 seconds left, and I'm going to give it to Lauren <laughs> and, and, and ask you just finally, we talked off the top about all of the factors that go into this phenomenon we're talking about today. 
What percentage of what we need to know about why this happens do you think we know? Well, you know, and, and ironically, I think, as I've said, a lot of it's from very general processes to which all young men are subjected in our society. Forces of globalization, communication, shrinkage of the world, quest for significance, need for moral imperatives. We understand a lot of that. What we don't understand is precisely how it all weaves together in the narrative of specific individuals. And we will see that this is idiosyncratic in some cases, but I'm confident if we can get enough data, we'll also see pattern more pattern than we're seeing now. And we need that more specific kind of insight to the pattern that is uh, present in these individuals so we can get beyond mm -hmm. our well-meaning generalities and start to nail this thing down. Well, for what it's worth, I appreciated your well-meaning generalities on our program mm -hmm. tonight. I want to thank mm -hmm. all five of you for coming into Side tonight, thank helping you. us out with this most troubling discussion. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.